All right, now on to the main attraction for this evening. Uh, we are honored to have Tom Birch here with us. Uh, for those of you who might not um, be aware, Tom is the manager of manufacturing systems at Canfor in the Wood Products Canada division. He holds a bachelor's in theology from TWU. Um, he is also a member of Mensa and has written three books. I did ask him if he would like me to mention them here, but that was not relevant. So here we are. Uh, Tom will be speaking on how to explore the structural differences between transactional databases and data warehouses. Um, it will look at how to bridge from operational to corporate data. Uh, many data warehouse projects overpromise and underdeliver. Sounds familiar, right? Um, this will cover some of the things that a business analyst should consider before jumping to a data warehouse project. Uh, before we begin, uh, if you have a question or a comment to make for Tom, uh, please do leave them in the chat box and I shall be parking them for Tom so that he can address them on the fly. Thank you. Over to you, Tom. Thank you very much. It is an honor and a privilege to be with you all tonight. And uh, thank you for the kind words uh, in my introduction. I wanted to go through um, some of my own uh, struggles with data warehouses. And I'm just going to start a PowerPoint so that uh, you don't just have to look at me. Um, so if I, oh, so yeah, I'm going to be looking at the pitfalls of data warehousing and the possibilities. I'll tell you that in my career, I've come across a lot of data warehousing, but I was working with um, more transactional hierarchical databases, and I never liked the data warehouses. I found them. Um, to not be productive and to be a lot of money sunk in that was wasted to the companies. But recently I am a convert and I'm looking at the possibilities that what we can actually do to leverage our data. Data is one of the most valuable things that a company has along with its people, which are the most valuable. It has its data that it can use, but it often sits idle and doesn't give back the um, value back to the company that they hope to get from it. So, um, so this is where I have always thought of data warehouses. They're the place where careers go to die. I worked with transactional business uh, databases and I had access to the data that everybody else wanted. And so they would come to me and, uh, and ask if I could pull together this data set or that data set. And what I ended up doing very often was creating views that mimicked what an ELT or a, an extract transform load process would do for a data warehouse, only all in a view against a transactional hierarchical data set. And the performance was abysmal. And the users who were asking me, the corporate people who were coming to me, who were trying to build these uh, warehouses, they never really understood the data uh, that I was giving them. They didn't understand the, the finer points of it. And they struggled with how to use it. And I just watched them and thought, wow, that's so much money, millions of dollars going into building something that isn't getting anywhere. So I thought of them as a place where a lot of money was spent on hardware. Nowadays, that would be more cloud services, a lot of software, a lot of time. They had an underwhelming delivery and they were expensive to maintain. Once they got them up and running, they would just kind of coast until they became irrelevant because nobody knew um, how to get them updated incrementally. A lot of these things were done on projects that once the project was done, there was no ongoing support for the data warehouse or the different um, extractions that were being done. They're even more expensive to update when you change out your source system and suddenly nothing that you had worked anymore. And the biggest problem I found was that they seemed to have minimal buy-in from the business users. Now, I want to um, clarify that I worked in the business side, not the corporate side. And data warehouses 
often were trying to meet a corporate need. Corporate would ask for them because they didn't have visibility into the business. And so they had more acceptance on that corporate level. But they, they should have been something that the business users could get value out of. And I never found the value there for the business users. So I put here um, a Lens, I don't even know if I can say his name right, <clears throat> Lenciani Trust Pyramid of sorts. I've adjusted some of the, the levels, but this is basically what we want on anything, any project that you do. You want at the end of the day, at the top of the pyramid that people will use whatever you build. You want to have that value that you've added. Um, in order for people to use it, they need to validate it, that it works. And before they're going to put in any effort to validate, they need to have buy-in. They need to be behind the project so that it's worth their time to look at it, validate it, and then say, yes, I can use that. But before people get buy-in, they need generally to have a seat at the table. And having a seat at the table when you're doing any project at all means that you can have healthy conflict. This is where you fight it out for what you want and what you don't want and how it'll fit together and how it will bring value. So this is a very awkward stage unless you have a lot of trust. If you trust each other across the company and you know that everybody is building toward what is needed, then you will have um, the ability to go into that healthy conflict where everyone has a seat at the table. But typically, what I found in my experience was data warehouse product projects would start at the buy-in phase. They would start there because somebody had already gone with an idea of what was needed or maybe a corporate mandate for what was needed and they would bring it to the business, but they've already built a cool demo, nice Power BI, dashboards, whatever the, the software of the day was. And then they would make an appeal for the users. Hey, look at this, it's really good. Can you help me validate the data? And they would hope to find users that would help them further enhance it. Maybe you've been in projects like this and you have something that you know you went away and you worked hard on and you're proud of it and it's good, but when you bring it out, you get various levels of excitement. And it quickly, the excitement quickly cools as they find data issues. They start looking and they go, eh, that's actually not a very good representation of my data. Or in some cases, they'll see something that to them makes their, their production look bad and they feel it's not right. And then they, they quickly back away from it and you get partial adoption. And corporate, of course, gets in more. They're desperate to see their data. They're desperate to see into the operations. And so they will come in a little bit more, but the business is often left out in the cold going, this isn't really what we were hoping it would be. The problem is that the, the further up the pyramid you are when you find problems, the harder it is to go back down. And we need to have people who can start at the bottom, building the trust, getting everybody at the table, understanding what the business is trying to do, and bridging um, between the business and the systems. And it's very much like a, um, a linguistic problem where you have to translate between languages and you need a translator who can take the English and put it into French or whatever other language. We need business analysts who can translate between the system people and the business people because they don't speak the same language. They think they do, but it's really quite different. So what happens when you get a multi-million dollar project and it's been rolling for some time and it's up to the point where it has to deliver? Guaranteed, it is not allowed to fail. 
there is no option for failure after you've sunk a significant amount of capital into a project. So giving up wears many faces. And this can be in, in any kind of project. I'm looking specifically at the data warehousing, but um, big companies uh, with any kind of big project, it has to succeed. So you have to let it kind of disappear quietly. Now, I showed this um, picture, that's the emperor there with no clothes. And I showed it to somebody in my department who's much younger than I am. And they had never heard of the story of the emperor's new clothes and how the emperor was tricked into believing that he had magical clothes that unless you were um, worthy of your station, you couldn't see them. And so everybody pretended they saw them because nobody wanted to be the one who said, but there's nothing there so that they wouldn't be embarrassed by not being worthy of their station until at some point, a small boy pointed out that the emperor was naked and uh, then everybody realized they'd been duped by the um, tailors. But what I find in these projects is that key players may jump from the company before it's determined that things have not gone as well as hoped. Teams get restructured. Now, there's lots of good reasons to restructure teams, and there's lots of good reasons for people to move from one company to another. But if it's happening because you're trying to avoid the um, place that a project has come to, then it's not as good, obviously. Um, one thing that I've found is in the last little while, few years, there have been a lot of self-serve data analytic tools that can go into a data lake and mine for whatever you need. And you get a data scientist and you give them a problem and they look at this mass of data in the data lake, or as some would say, the data swamp, where it's just a quagmire of mess. And they go in and they start sifting through and finding the answer to problems. And this is a good thing, but I feel in ways that it's been used as an excuse for why the data warehouse hasn't worked. And instead of saying that the IT department wasn't able to deliver, the problem comes that, well, it's really the business's problem because they haven't put in the right data scientists to go and mine their own data. And we push the problem back onto the business and say, it's your responsibility. I, I see the comment there on trust. I totally agree, critical having trust. Um, so there's been a push that way, which is not a bad thing. It's, a, it's really good tools coming out, but somehow we just, divest ourselves of our responsibility to help our users. And finally, we reset and we restart. And on we go. So this is my idea of a dysfunctional data warehouse life cycle. I'll talk about data, life, uh, data warehouse life cycles in a minute, but here's my dysfunctional life cycle. And I, this is, I've seen done a number of times in various companies over the years. So you start with the design and it's all about the newest tools. Can I get this into Azure and have a ADF pipelines and maybe some data bricks to build up my data lake house or we need a Delta lake or we move into all the tools. Where's my snowflake and, and what should I pick AWS or Azure? And, and all of those questions, which are valid and critical. And we need people who can sift through the specific requirements at a company and pick the right tools. But the tools aren't the primary problem. It's making sure that we are connected with our users and we've understood their requirements. So then we go into the building phase. <clears throat> and this is where we build a flashy dashboard 
and we don't worry about the data. We'll get the data fixed later. We have just got to make it so it's attractive and the users will be drawn to it. And then we'll fix the data because we haven't had the time to sit and work with our business users and understand their data sets. So we get that going and then we're up to the buy-in stage. So we do the demos, we do some training and it's training on how the tools work. But when they ask about the data, it's, well, it's your data, you should understand it, don't you? And we try and push that onto the, to the users and just teach them the tools. And it's already too late to get buy-in because nobody had a seat at the table, nobody had the trust. And now they're just being asked to help fix the data. And then we hit the rollout. And by the time we hit the rollout, the honeymoon is just about over. Everybody's getting tired of the product already. They're wondering, how do I put this into my daily life? You know, if you're running nine hours a day, trying to get your job done, and somebody says, I'm gonna give you a tool, if that tool can take half an hour of time off my day or an hour of, of uh, manual work, then I want it. But if I'm afraid that that tool is gonna add an hour of time or it's not gonna be any value, it's not gonna give me answers I need, then I don't have any time for it. And this is where we get to because people don't have the trust and the buy-in, they don't really believe that the tool is gonna give them anything of value, and so they don't build, buy into it. If you're in a project that is multi-million dollar and it has gone wrong because it did not involve the users when it should have, about one third of the way, here's the first tip, this will, this will help you and save your career. One third of the way through the rollout, take a job with another company. You can say that you did the whole project life cycle, got right to the end, and then whatever happened afterward isn't your fault because you weren't there. So that's, that's the, uh, the, the sweet spot right there. But of course, we don't want to do that. We want to bring value to our company and to our users, and we want to solve problems. And so rather than starting over at the beginning with new tools, we want to do this a different way. So I've talked about some of the pitfalls and I've really focused not on tools because I think all kinds of tools will work, but on the process and the involvement of people. Um, <laughs> yeah, HR wouldn't like it if you jump out at, <laughs> at that point. Was tongue in cheek, didn't really mean for anyone to do that. Um, now let's talk about some of the possibilities. Now, I know we have a, a very wide audience here today, and I'm not sure how much um, data warehouse work everyone has done. Maybe some of you are, are deeply involved in data warehouses and hopefully not totally offended with me yet. Um, I will talk about the good stuff now. And maybe some of you don't have as much understanding with the uh, data warehouses. So I wanted to do one screen here where I just talk a little bit about the basic structure of a data warehouse. So this is very different from any business transactional database. And it's flattened out uh, immensely. So you have everything based around a business process, what we call a fact table or a measure table. And so that's my star in the middle of a star schema. So we call these star schemas. And it will have one business process only that is modeled by it. So the fact is an event that is counted or measured. And you see, I have some red uh, fields at the bottom here. Those are my measurement fields. So I have a, a count, I have some tons, I have some meters cubed, I have a conversion number that gets me between tons and meters cubed. That is the measurement that I, I'm taking in this inventory example. And then around that measure, you have what we call dimension tables. And the dimension is a reference to data about the fact. So it might be the date 
or the product or the customer. And so as many um, dimensions as you can make that relate to how those measurements were taken, you tie those in and you have those dimension tables around the star. And that's the basic structure of a data warehouse. And the beauty of it is that you will have the same dimensions on multiple um, measurement tables or fact tables. So if I have a date um, dimension, for example, and it goes into my calendar and you see that up at this top right, I have a date and a day and a month and a fiscal month and a quarter and whatever else, holiday days, weekends, days of the week, all of that is there. Well, it will tie into every um, fact table you have just about. So you only have to create the dimensions once. And then if there's more attributes, you can add them in. So that's the basic um, structure of a data warehouse. And it is um, very different from, so people who have come over from the business transactional databases, they will struggle at first with the way that this is structured and it's flattened out all the data, but that's what gives it the speed for retrieval and being able to manage the data. So if we look at the nature of a data warehouse, we'll find the scope of it is corporate. It's always gonna be something very large and it, it comes in around all of the business that the company does, but it's built with um, building blocks that are business process centered. It has to start with the business. And that's why we have um, tools out there now like Databricks that are looking at each of those, you know, how do I feed data into one brick, one piece of this whole thing. And you must stay focused on those business processes. Um, a data, a star schema in a data warehouse is gonna be flat, not hierarchical, because it's not trying to help you edit data. It's just trying to retrieve and summarize data. There's no editing going on, so you don't have to worry about um, inheritance and propagation of, of attributes through a hierarchy. Another thing about them is that they are historical versus current. And a comment here, we can do live updates in BRICS as we have day-to-day -day business transactions going on. Yes. Um, so I, I said here it's historical versus current, but historical could be one minute ago. You can pull data at any rate that you want. But if you're trying to pull data every minute or every five minutes from something, um, the processes are going to be far more complex and you will spend a lot more money. So you need to know that it's worth having that currency on your data. Generally, most data sets um, will end up being at the end of a shift or the end of a day that they'll get um, pulled out and into the data warehouse. And there's time for it to move through that. But yes, they can go very quickly, but they are all um, still looking at the past. So when you have um, a data warehouse, you can look at trends and you can use those trends to predict into the future, but you're not typically using it to monitor your equipment and see if something's about to break. Um, you might, but typically you'll have a more uh, current uh, transactional system that's monitoring things in the moment for the, the people running the, the shift at the time. But the data warehouse then gives people a way of looking over what has happened. And the data warehouse is going to be conformed versus being local. And by conformed, I mean you may have different things at different operations, but when you pull all your operations together, you need to standardize so that you can compare um, between them. So as an example, now, if I was to ask you, what is a ton? I imagine that all of you would have some idea in your mind about what a ton is. Um, Anybody in 
North America and Britain would probably say, well, there's metric and there's imperial tons and the rest of the world may not remember imperial tons. But we had uh, a problem or a challenge with one of the mills that we bought where they were bringing in chips and they said, what is a ton of chips? How do we measure them? And without being deeply into the business, this is a hard question to answer. And therefore it impacts how you would build your measure table. Uh, yes, wood chips, it, it is wood chips. So if I have a metric ton, that's 2,205 pounds, give or take. If I have a short ton or, or what we just typically call a, an imperial ton or a ton, that's 2,000 pounds. We had a thing they called a unit. Now they called it a bone dry unit because the wood chips get um, cooked until all the moisture's out of them and then they weigh them bone dry. So it's not the, the green weight with the moisture in, but a dry weight and it was 2,400 pounds. I think they made it up just to make life interesting. I've never heard of the unit before. Then you have a long ton and I put this one out in detail. A long ton is 2,240 2, pounds. And it's based off of the British measurements, the old measurements where 14 pounds equals one stone. And if you go to Britain today, people will still tell you I weigh 15 stone or I'm trying to weigh less than 15 stone, maybe. Um, two stones made a quarter, but because we didn't start at 12 and a half, a quarter is 28 pounds. Four quarters is a hundred weight, which is 112 pounds and 20 hundred weight equals one long ton of 2240. If you don't know how they're using these measures and you, you don't dig deep enough, when you get to your fact tables, and you're trying to do the measure, you'll have your conversions wrong. People will look at it and they'll say, hey, I'm, I seem to be out 5%. I don't understand why, I don't trust your data. And then they turn away from it. We need to be deeply involved with our business to find out how do they use these things. Now, this is just one um, fairly simple example with weights, but there's so many places where we can trip up if we don't pay attention. Copy of the sidekick. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure how to answer that question um, on sidekick BBE. But yes, data quality is a huge issue that we all struggle with. So if you're walk working with data warehouses, um, we need to be looking at the structures and the processes and making sure that we're committed to following through with them. We need to work from the bottom up, not the top down. So there has to be a business connection. This is a huge, huge possibility or pro a possibility for um, working into your organization to get greater value. And yes, I can make a slide deck available, you betcha. Um, we need to get uh, the best tools for sure, but that's after we sort out the data needs. If you are committed to a tool, your job will last as long as the company is using that tool, and then it ends. And your value will be limited by that tool's lifespan. We need to be um, committed to the business process and to the to the different departments that we're serving and let the tools study what's out there, get the best ones you can afford, the best ones for for what you're doing on your um, on your company's uh, needs, but don't get tied to them because they will come and go. And then map out the business process bus. This is a list of all of the business processes that you do within your business. It will never be wasted time. You need to have so much effort into understanding how does the data flow from one um, event to another event? What are the business processes that they're trying to get answers on? And um, 
this is where, and somebody made a comment there that uh, organizations rely on Excel. And yes, they do. And they do that for a reason. It's because they don't have a tool that they feel they can manipulate the data in to get their answer. And so they're forced back into what they know and it's an isolated spreadsheet that they can't do anything with other than one person uses it. And maybe you organize a department and you put it on a SharePoint or something and you try to get different people, but it, it very quickly runs out of its value. It's too, too um, isolated and the data is not repeatable. And we have people who build tons and tons of uh, programming into an Excel spreadsheet and uh, it's <laughs> the world's best ERP in many people's minds. So you wanna make sure that you are absolutely dedicated to the business, the data warehouse process. Now this book, and I think, I don't know if it shows backward to you like it does to me or not, but the data warehouse toolkit, whatever your process is, this is the Kimball uh, Bible, if you like, um, you want to know it, understand how it works. If you use a different process than Kimball, get that their book and make sure that your team is all on side, that you're not doing a hybrid between a, a transactional database and a data warehouse database. This is um, from Kimball's side, which is the, the primary, more dominant data warehouse um, still, I believe. This is their... Uh, life cycle. I stole it straight out of their book or off their website, I think. And then I um, just colored it. And this is where I think the possibilities lie. We have lots of people who have technical expertise and can learn any new program and can do the, the grunt work. Well, grunt work is the wrong term, but do the hard work of getting the data to move. But I think that we the organizations I have worked with are la have been lacking in the business requirement definition, dimensional modeling, understanding the data that our users are using and what they want, the BI application design, what do they want to get out of the final system? And those three boxes there on the left that I've got in pink, those are the ones that I find there's huge potential to get in and do more work there with the business that would save millions of dollars in failed projects or um, partially successful projects and the time it takes to keep going back to redo and to get the data quality up front and get the, the understanding of what the business needs. If we can hit what the business needs, corporate will have what they need too. If we start with corporate, which is, let's face it, usually where the budget is, you, you will end up not providing what the business needs and you'll be in the middle of what corporate needs. But if we can say, okay, corporate is sending us out with a mandate, let's get into the business side and, and figure out what we need, then we have greater success. The reason I colored the ETL ELT design and development box, so that's, um, in case you're not familiar with the term, the extract, transform, load, or extract, load, and transform routines. This takes the data out of one format and puts it into the star schemas. We need to understand how things change. An example there is if, if I have a mill and I'm bringing logs in and I say, well, this is a medium-sized log. It's between 10 and 14 inches. And then a year from now, I change out some of the machinery and I say, well, 10 to 14 is no longer medium, 9 to 13 is medium. Then I need to have a slowly changing dimension that has dates binding it and says, okay, medium now means something different after this date. And so that's something too, where we need to have a business understanding to make sure that we've got the, um, the correct procedures being modeled. And a lot of this stuff actually isn't even as technical. It, it's still technical, but it's it's in that world of, of more 
higher level understanding of the data flows. And so if that's something that you're drawn toward, there's a big place in uh, the processing of data for the person who understands the high level and how the flow goes from one process to another. So that's um, generally speaking, where I think the pitfalls and the possibilities are. But I want to go into an example that we did um, just in a uh, project that we were starting into. Now, our production system tracks the conversion of logs into lumber. And it does this as it moves through four different um, inventories. So we have logs in log yard and we have a log yard inventory, of course. Uh, we have rough green lumber. So when you first cut the log up into lumber sized pieces, it's uh, still wet. So we call it rough green. Then we end up with, we dry it and it becomes rough dry lumber. And then finally we finish it. And um, in finishing it, we smooth out the sides and the ends, right? So those four um, inventory group or inventory um, buckets are processed through three different um, processing plants. We have a sawmill. So we bring a log into the sawmill and the rough green lumber comes out. Then it goes into the kiln. It goes in as rough green. It comes out as rough dry. And finally, it goes into the planer. And in the planer, it comes in as rough dry and it goes out as a finished lumber product that you can then is ready for sale. So we were looking at one of our mills and I'm just gonna break it into those three um, processing plants, the sawmill, the kiln and the planer. So we have some data pickup points within the sawmill. Now, any one of these points could be used to create a data warehouse star schema but there's some red boxes. These are the ones we selected. And then the green boxes are what tie into our inventory system. So of course, every system you have ties into other systems. So as a log comes through, the first thing it hits is a debarker, um, which does exactly what it sounds like. It takes the bark off. Then it goes into a primary breakdown. And the primary breakdown is cutting the log into a square. So it basically cuts off the top, bottom, and the two sides. And we call that a cant because trees can't be square. No, I don't know why they call it a cant. But, um, oh, the bark um, ends up going into typically um, a power plant where we burn it. And uh, then it, it provides electricity to power the mill, or it might provide heat to uh, power the kilns, one or the other. So um, the next thing after the primary breakdown is it goes into a secondary, which takes the square cant and cuts it into more boards. And then it goes to an edger, which cleans up the side. And then the trim sort, which is of interest to us again, it trims the ends and it sorts it into the kinds of uh, boards that we have. And then it goes out to the stacker. So in our project, we wanted to look at the primary breakdown and the trim sort and just see what's happening at this transformation point. Um, next, uh, oh, so yeah, forget which order my slides are in, sorry. Um, the primary breakdown as our first data uh, center that we wanted to pull data in from, and this one I'll show you the data as it's coming in, in a little bit. Um, it consumes logs, so that draws down the log inventory. It tracks data at a log to board level. So it has, um, basically it, we scan the log so we know all the dimensions of it and the optimizers comes up with what it thinks the boards will be when it cuts it. Of course, you're never sure because as you cut into a log, it could have rot or something inside that would change what you end up doing. But it tells you what the anticipated outturn would be. And I have a question, is there any process of data and nominalization in case pre-production? Um, I'm not 100% sure what you mean by that. We, what we end up doing at this point, we end up 
taking what we think the boards are going to be. So that is pre-production. Um, no, not not really a data masking, but we do we do anticipate what will happen, and then later we measure what did happen. Um, this one data set. Uh, if we looked at it across all of the mills that Canfor has in Canada and the United States, we create six, about 6 billion boards a year. And given that, if you wanted to track five years of data, you could have a star schema with the fact table holding 30 billion records. So obviously performance is going to be a king in this uh, data set. And then the logs get grouped together so that we can say, well, this type of log, this, these, you know, a medium log of this length, what does it give, give me back? And um, then we have other dimensions that we could get. The other thing for the data lake, we, we looked at the possibility of storing all of the, the um, log scans, which are uh, very data intensive. And whether or not we can do that or not, we, it was uh, for later but just something we mentioned. The second data set there was this uh, trim sort and it creates the rough green data. So the, the primary breakdown anticipates what boards will get, whereas the trim sort tells me what boards I did get. And so we wanted to get that data set. It is also a large and complex data set, but then it could be compared back to say, if I anticipated um, 100 boards, did I get 95 or did I get, you know, how much did I lose off of what I thought I was going to get? Um, yes, we do track the volume of the finished logs produced um, to back to the log. So a log is, um, we typically measure our logs in cubic meters and one cubic meter of wood can create uh, 424 board feet of wood and a board foot is a board that is one inch thick and 12, uh, one foot by one foot by one inch. So we track everything back to that. And in the processing of the log, we have a good 30% that ends up just chipped or sawdust. And that also with the bark will go into uh, burning for um, electricity and, and heat for the kilns. <clears throat> so here's a, a real world issue that we hit right away. And there's a lesson in this, and which is why I bring it up. So we want to know on the logs, how they relate back to my log yard inventory. Now the scans are very precise. They know exactly to the millimeter how big the log was. But in the log yard, we basically had anticipated six different classifications, small, medium, large, extra large, head rig, and oversized. Um, so when we started our system for the log yard inventory six years ago, we had these red values and that was all there was for the diameter of the log. What happened is over the years, all of the black ones that are in there were added by our users. And that is a, a clear sign whenever your user does something like this, that they have a missing um, piece to their system. There's something they want to track and they can't. And so, you know, I'd love to be upset with them for messing up the data, but the real thing is the system was not giving them what they needed. So when they added things like SMGB, a premium small Douglas fir, they're basically adding a quality measurement to the log. So it's a premium log, not just a regular log. And you can look down through these and you'll see um, some of the terms may not make a lot of sense like Genban, but it's really a quality measurement or access mat. It means this is a log good enough to make access mat with. Um, what they really needed was a quality field and they didn't have it. Uh, so what I ended up having to do was break this back down so that all of these black ones could still get brought back to a measurement of the diameter because the scanner is not scanning quality. It is just scanning the dimension, the size. 
And so we had to bring that back so that we'd be able to compare the logs back to the scans and, the, and join the log yard inventory back into the uh, scans that were going on. So I have a question here. How long do you keep or archive the log data? Or do you just capture the basic metrics for future reference? I'm government and we keep everything forever. Yes, you do. Um, yeah, so we actually want to keep our log data here um, for a minimum of five years and probably forever. We, we actually are just like you in that way. The problem I had with my original system was it had no space for keeping this. It's a very large data set. And so now that we're pushing the data up into the cloud and, and pulling it into an Azure database or a database in Azure, um, we're able to have the space to keep that data. And we've only got a few months worth. Like I said, this is a project that's just started. So we used to purge the data. We summarized it. We rolled it up and summarized it and the summaries were kept forever. But the raw data and the granular level was lost after three months. And that is a tragedy. Okay, so uh, the next was the kilns. I think I can go through them very quick. Kilns, the kiln in takes in the rough green lumber, goes to one of our four kilns. Don't worry about these numbers next to them. Those are the primary keys of my kilns. And I just had this slide from before. Um, and then out comes rough dry lumber uh, some hours or days later, depending on how wet the wood was. So that's uh, an area where we could track uh, the ins and outs of the kiln. And then the third, um, oh yeah, then kiln creates rough green, or consumes rough green, creates rough dry. Very simple data set. Our third uh, center was the planer. And this is where we take our rough dry lumber in and we finish it up to be uh, able to sell it. And so again, there's a series of steps that the the lumber goes through, goes up a tilt hoist. This is where it gets uh, consumed. From there, it gets spread out and put through the planer one board at a time, which smooths the four sides of the board. Then it goes to a trim sort, which cuts off the ends and then sorts it out to the various products. And from there, you stack it, you strap it, you put wrap on it and labels and then these last two were just things that we could do. Um, a whole tech is actually a, a saw that cuts a whole pack of lumber in half. So if you have 20 foot pack of lumber and you need two tens, you can uh, cut it in half and then you're changing, you're consuming your finished goods to create other finished goods. And um, Reman is just changing the grade of the uh, package. So we identified these four different uh, areas where we could pick up data. And so looking at those, the tilt hoist is pretty basic. It just is bringing in the rough dry um, one pack at a time. The trim sort, however, is um, a very critical piece for us because this tells us if I have um, a two by four that's 20 feet long and it's rough dry and I put it through, what kind of grade uh, distribution can I expect? So I'll get some economy lumber that's all kind of twisted and gnarly. It's the, the stuff you don't want to make your fence out of. And I'll get some high grade lumber that, uh, you know, is good for, for anything you want to do. It can be exposed because it's a beautiful piece, a, you know, a beautiful board. So we're always looking for the percentage of outturns that we get, um, whether it's low grade or high grade. And so that was a, an important um, data set for us. And then the packager out is actually just counting how much um, did, how many packs of lumber did we put out there that's ready to sell. And obviously the whole tech and the reman is just consuming and creating finished goods in different ways. So, Let's see, sorry, just uh, catching my place again in my notes, sorry. Uh, the production system 
systems that we had, we looked at seven different star schemas. And so in our project, we said, this is what we want to do. And we want to get in and, and create all seven of these, and we'll be able to relate data right across the production process. And there's the seven just summarized. We've looked at each one of them in detail. And we put in here, you know, this is large and complex, or it's simple or whatever um, size it would be in order to get some rough idea of how much effort it was going to be to build these out. And here's the lesson, way too much, way too much. In the end, we settled on data set one and five as being the most important and data sets that we could build on. But data warehousing is not a project. It's a way of life. You start with something and you build it out until it's useful. And then you add to either that one data set, you add extra attributes, more dimensions, or you add another data set that can tie into it or, or move along. It's something that you'll be doing forever if you do it right. And the, the companies that want to have data warehouses need to realize that they're committing to a um, could be a small team a team of whatever size depending on how big the company is that will continually be looking at um, well continual improvement how do i add to this how do i maintain it what happens when we change source systems buy a new division and we have to get their data you know brought in <coughs> excuse me and so it's um, something you want to start with slowly and work through uh, continually. Now, when I looked at this data and we said, okay, well, what are we going to do for our reporting requirements? We needed some basic KPIs, uh, our key performance indicators. Um, we wanted to get some end-to-end -end reporting. But you know, we already have a lot of reporting out of our other systems and our KPIs are fairly well handled. What we find is the missing link is how do we do the ad hoc analysis? Now it's one thing to, to just say, well, we're gonna hire data scientists and we're gonna ask them to answer our questions for us. But you really wanna put into your end users hands as much power as Excel gives them so that we can get them out of Excel, or at least out of Excel as the place where they manage the data. They want to have it managed somewhere else that is um, more maintainable and visible to the whole company. So this is what we put out as what we wanted our users to be able to do. Select which attributes from the dimensions that were important to them to view be able to filter those dimension attributes with things like equals and like and in and before and all that, all the good stuff, depending on the data type that it was. Um, determine the measure attributes that they want to view and how they want to group them, whether they're counting or summing or mins and maxes and averages, et cetera. And be able to save that setup so that you could come back to it later and not have to reproduce everything you did every time you look at the data and um, be able to export it and then also be able to use it into other widgets whether it's graphs or whatever you whatever it is that somebody wants so that was our our full project and now if you want um, i think we still have time yes i'm not out of time yet i'll show you a little bit of what it looks like and just sort of how that that came through so we'll just end that show. And how am I doing? Are we going too fast? Or anybody has any other questions before we go here? Uh, we have a question. Yeah. From, um, it says, uh, does your experience with the problems of your data warehouse system reflect on the performance of the business analysts? define the requirements you know i i don't think so i i think that the the problem is the mandate that comes down so if your mandate is to to build something you go and you build something 
And I think that we have undervalued the role of the business analyst who works with the business and understands their systems. When I've come into a new system, like our log uh, procurement system, it generally takes six to six months to a year before you fully understand all the ins and outs of the data that's going through there. And you can't expect somebody from um, outside of that business unit to come in and be able to have that level of understanding. And that's where you need to, to have business analysts who are tied to the different business units and then leverage their knowledge. So they're working with the business all the time and then they come in and they work with the uh, data people so that they can make sure things flow. Now, the more you know on how to get in and, and create the ETLs and manage the um, ADF pipelines or whatever it is you're using, the better. But you need to get those people in place and uh, be able to get the knowledge back in. Otherwise, you've kind of been set up for failure if you don't have that, that um, access. Yeah, I totally agree. Need the alignment before you go down the rabbit hole. That is uh, so true. Um, <laughs> I have been a poor BA before and, and felt like I was being shot at. And I, I, um, I hope that you're not hearing me coming down on projects that have gone astray. We've all been in projects, well, depending on how old you are. If you're, if you're not very old yet, you'll, you'll get one. Uh, you know, projects that go sideways. But um, we absolutely need to, to review those and say, okay, now how, what's missing? What are the missing parts? And so I'm hoping that from this evening, you'll get an idea of things that you could do with projects you're on right now or, or planning to ensure their success, and maybe um, uh, directions that you might take in your own career that would give you a door into being that person who can help to bridge the, the gaps. Um, this is an example of that first data set that I talked about. So just to explain some of the codes down here, I have on the wrong page, here we go. I'm still sharing, right? I think so. Um, yes. Okay, good. I, I lost the, the bar. I didn't see it for a second around my window. Uh, so if I have this value here and I just put color to help uh, make the parts pop, profile 10, 10, 12.5, what that means is that the small end of the log is 10 inches. Also the long, the large end of the log is 10 inches because of course logs are generally tapered, but you know, maybe not very tapered in this case. And the length, length of the log is 12 and a half feet. So that's what that profile 10, 10, 12.5 means. And then you'll see product codes like this one here. And the way that breaks out in our system, YC is the species, which is Southern yellow pine. This is an example from one of our US mills. Um, 104 is the dimension, so that's a one by four inch dimension. RG stands for rough green. The 0.1 tells me that it's a single board. If it was a package, it might be 0.200 to say there's 200 boards in the pack. And the 08 is how many feet long it is, so eight feet long. So just to, to help make sense out of the data a little bit. So when I'm looking at this, and, and I, I hope it's not too small, um, but I can't make it any bigger. So, well, maybe I can. Maybe. Oh, I can too. Of course I can. Um, you can see the different profiles here. The profile, there's three levels. So it breaks into the dimension. So this is a one by four rough and then the actual product. And so in this case, the product is, is mostly just telling me that it's eight foot, 10 foot, 12 foot. We do have some differences at different places, but generally the rough is pretty simple. And then you can see I have um, a board count. So I have 35 boards of yellow, um, southern yellow um, pine, 
one by four rough green, eight foot. And then there's my finished volume in board feet, 93.33 board feet. And then you have the log volumes and counts. And so this is out of 477 logs. So I didn't get very much volume here. Most of my volume is down in the 12 foot length and in my um, two by four instead of two by, or one by um, four. I have a two by four that I have 500 in the 12 foot length. And that makes sense. This is a 12 and a half foot log. So we're gonna cut a lot of 12 foot boards out of it. And then um, if you remember, I mentioned that we have um, 424 board feet in one cubic meter. And that's what we call our log recovery factor. And so it's very important that the log recovery factor is as high as we can get it. So it generally we lose 30% of the log into chips and sawdust and 70%, about 300 as a log recovery factor. You can see some of these logs have done um, quite a bit better, 315 and so, depending on the profile. And then this is additive. So if I go 12 plus one plus one, that gives me my 14. Um, if I take my 14 plus the zero and the 60 and the 90 and the 146, that'll give me my 310. So I can add up my log recovery factor, which is how many board feet I'm getting per one cubic meter. And then I can also see the number of boards of each um, uh, kind of product. So this gave me a lot of data to work with that we can then use for projecting into the future. I can say, if, if I have these kinds of profiles of logs, what can I expect to get for my boards so that I know what I can sell in the future? Now, I'm just gonna make that a little smaller again. You'll see up at the top, I have a bunch of uh, filters. So if I want to come in and filter to a given profile, I can put in a search, find here's all my 13 by 13s and I could uh, go down further. I'll get down to ones where the, the large end is, is actually larger. So 13 to inch to 14 inch, it's an 18.2 foot log. And uh, if I filter on that, then I'll get a whole different data set. When I take the filters off, and this was really key for us, you see how quickly that came back. The performance is absolutely critical. So at this point, I'm looking at uh, 2.8 million boards. So not very much compared to the uh, billions I said we were gonna get to if we put all of our mills in. But with the three, three million, I'm still getting near instant response time. So that's encouraging. Um, they've put together uh, some dashboards for me. So some of the basic things I can come in here and I can see my log volume and the log volume and the log count. So the number of logs is the red line, the amount of cubic meters is the bars. And then um, the next one down, I have my boards, finished volume and the board count. And then, of course, because the LRF is so important to us, I have my LRF down here. If I click on just one of these, it automatically adjusts. If I want to grab a few of them, I can update to whatever I want. All the graphs adjust, of course. This is currently looking at the last 30 days. If I want to switch that out, I can go year to date or quarter to date or whatever I want to do there. If I click down here, I get everything back. So a quick uh, interface to get at my KPIs. But one of the things that I mentioned to you is really critical is giving our users the ability to get in and do a lot of their own searching. And after taking a few swipes at Excel, I will say that Excel is actually still a good tool for a lot of our users because our data scientist is gonna go and use all kinds of tools to get in and, and study through all of this data. I spend a good portion of any given day in Toad looking at uh, 
data in my databases. But I have users who can't figure out how to save a spreadsheet into a CSV file so that it'll upload into a program. And we need to give them tools as well. So this is a simple tool in here where they, they can come in and just look at the KPIs and the data and I have a few other tabs. But I can also come up here and export and analyze in Excel. And this is um, actually, I was very skeptical because I'm not really thrilled with Excel as a tool um, for, for managing data, but it's not actually managing data here. Now it's giving me a warning that uh, there's macros and it may not be safe. And I just say, yeah, I know it, it's, it's fine. So in here, what this is doing is bringing in links to the tables, but it's not actually bringing in the data. And then on the side here, I have all my dimensions and my fact tables. I can choose what I want to look at. I can throw them into the filters and the rows. And this is in Excel online, but I can also save this onto my um, computer and, and have um, a copy of it which is not, not bringing in the data, but just the links. So this one I saved just before the meeting and I played with it a little bit so that you wouldn't have to watch me fumbling around in Excel. Um, and so I have my, my values down here. I can see in here I've filtered. So I've filtered it to logs that are, oh, doesn't like that and never click on something you haven't tested. Um, I filtered it to 20 foot and longer logs and I filtered it to um, the 20 foot boards to find out if I have a 20 foot or longer log, how many 20 foot boards do I get? And I have it by the dimensions. So you can see I've got a two by four rough, two by six rough, two by eight, 10 and 12. And then I have my LRFs and my board count and my log volumes and everything is coming in here. The um, the first column here is my small end diameter, so five inch, six inch, seven inch, and you can see the period that it's uh, last seven days, and then it looks at the last thirty days, last week. So it has my different periods in there, and using the pivot tables and the slicing and stuff in Excel, my end users can get at this data and really. Um, see it the way they're used to seeing it. And when I look at the file, this is the, the file here, and you'll see it's only 33 KB. So it hasn't tried to pull tons of data out of the cloud and uh, anything like that. It just has a dynamic link up. And whenever I change what I'm looking at here, it goes back into the cloud, summarizes the data there and pulls it back down here. And it's uh, a few seconds to do the refreshing. So that gives me the ability to give my users something that they're used to. Um, for the more, more power users in Excel, but not power users like a data scientist, they have a, an environment in which they can get the answers they want. So most of my accountants like this kind of uh, an interface. So. That's um, that's my demo of the project that we did. Now we're just coming to the end of this. I have um, the second data set to sign off on um, probably early next week. And then we'll have the two data sets. And what we're gonna end up doing probably next is we'll expand it to each of our mills because all of the processes will be there. We should be able to move it rapidly between the uh, from one mill to the other 24 and we will start looking on these data sets what else could we add that would be of instant value until all of the users because we have a few users that have been involved um, into this uh, so far mostly this project was getting all of our processing in place to move the data up into the cloud and uh, and get our environments set down. But the users have, of course, been involved at looking at um, what data we're bringing in and where we can go in the future with this data. 
So we'll probably add more attributes into the dimensions and more measures into the, uh, the fact table. And then at the same time, move it out to all of the different uh, uh, mills that we have. And then we'll look at, you know, take a deep breath and maybe go on holidays for a week and, or two, and then uh, come back and say, okay, what's the next business process that needs to be modeled? Should we look back at those, the other five that we didn't do this first time around and uh, try and bring those into the fold? Or do we say, actually, we want to look at something else? How do we tie this more tightly back to the log yard inventory? Or are we moving forward into the sales side and how we tie it into sales? So those kinds of decisions too um, are group decisions where everyone has to have a seat at the table and say, what I really need next is, and put the priority on the order in which the work gets done. And my goal um, in the next five years is to get all of the data that's under my purview up into the um, Azure environment, or if that changes in the next few years as other things come available, we'll move with that. But have all of this available for our users so that they can get at whatever they need. And I'll just stop sharing there and uh, hand it back over 